Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, hope everyone is nice and safe and sound. One. Good morning, everyone. Um, Hey guys, how's it going? Good morning. It's Tuesday. It is April 28th. I'm losing track of the days. Um, today's lesson is going to be really important. The lecture, we're going to discuss a couple of things that are absolutely very important, not only to understanding the novel and the meaning of the title and really coming um, to understand why Holden is the way he is, but it's also the third and very important part of uh, of the information you're going to need for your essay, which will be due in a couple of weeks. We're going to go over it. Um, there will be no assignments in class during those weeks. It'll just be slow writing. So you'll have more than enough time to do it. Uh, and I'll make sure that you're well prepared. We're also going to set up some essay conferences, which I'll return your essays to you. I'm still figuring out how uh, we're going to do that. Uh, but rest assured, it will get done. And I want to be able to give you guys as much insightful input as I possibly can in terms of improving your writing uh, for next year and obviously for college uh, level standards. So um, let's pick it up from where we left off. Um, I Just to refresh our memory, last we left, Holden was at his home. He had snuck in. Um, he We finally meet his kid sister, Phoebe. Uh, whose name is very significant. It's associated with light. Uh, Phoebe comes from an ancient Greek uh, illusion. Uh, and the word Phoebe means the shining one. And in many ways, you'll see that towards the end of the novel, starting here, but especially towards chapter 25 and the last uh, chapter, that Phoebe really becomes a catalyst for Holden. She's the one that really makes him see the light, so to speak, and kind of uh, speeds up his transformation towards the end, his epiphany. Um, and she's, she'll be present there during his, uh, emotional kind of mental breakdown that lands him in the rest home. Okay. But Phoebe is very much a positive influence on Holden, uh, especially throughout the end or the conclusion of the novel. All right. You know, a lot of you, um, in your reflections and your writing and your homework questions, you pick up on these little details that have occurred through the chapter. And it goes to show, you know, I'm impressed because it goes to show that, a lot of you are not only sticklers for details, but you're kind of reading carefully, which is very important. Um, and, you know, the novel has a lot of secrets, has a lot of little details. We could spend a whole year speaking about certain things. But uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, in terms of being able to teach it uh, and not get lost in the details, we do kind of skip over. But I do applaud many of you for your kind of relentless uh research, not research, but critical thinking, basically, and just applying things to every little detail in, in the novel you can. It goes to show that many of you are enjoying the reading, all right? All right, so we're going to pick it up on chapter or in chapter 22. Um, uh, Holden here is with Phoebe, and Phoebe challenges him at one point. She asks him, right? This is after Holden's given her the record. Keep in mind, I'm going to remind you again that the record, uh, Little Shirley Beans, is a symbol of innocence, and childhood, not only for the contents of the song, but also how Holden regards it. The record's round. It represents a circle, which represents perfection. Um, we also know that um, Salinger became very Buddhist towards the end of his life. You know, he had abandoned the Jewish or uh, Christian kind of religious ideals that his parents had kind of, or culture had bestowed upon him um, and started to embrace a lot more kind of Eastern or more kind of Asian philosophies about spirituality and religion. Um, and I think that kind of makes an appearance when he meets up with Carl Luce. Um, and Carl Luce goes on to talk about the spirituality of sexuality and all these other things, right? Circles are very important in Buddhism, right? They represent the most perfect geometric shape, the shattering of the record, like we discussed, the loss of innocence, and Holden's desire even to keep the broken pieces, right? Represent his desire to hold on to his childhood, even though it's irrevocably, which means like irreversibly uh, gone in many ways because of the experiences that he's had, of which one of the more important experiences is um, his witness of the suicide of one of his former classmates, James Castle. Um, there seems to be a very interesting role reversal here. Uh, many of you picked up 
uh, on that during your homework responses. That um, when he meets with Phoebe, it seems like their roles are reversed. Phoebe seems to be the older sibling, and Holden takes on a much more immature kind of um, younger uh, perspective on things. There's definitely a role reversal here. And Phoebe challenges him, you know. She understands that Holden's uh, failing at certain things at school. She's probably heard her parents speak about it quite often, right? Um, and she calls him on certain things, you know. She she challenges him. She questions what are some things that you like because maybe she's come to see that Holden is this kind of like very negative person in many ways that whatever experiences he's had, be it the death of Ali or James Castle uh, or all the variety of negative experiences he's had with adulthood and coming of age have kind of made him a very pessimistic person. So um, she kind of challenges him at one point, right? She's, she calls him on his swearing, right? She, she uh, holds him to a higher ideal about the language and all that and profanity. Um, he is swearing in front of her. She is 10. Um, and she kind of, kind of calls him on that. And at one point she says, um, for me, it's page 169, but we're about four pages into chapter 22. She says to him, um, you don't like anything that's happening. It made me even more depressed when she said that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Sure, I do. Don't say that. Why the hell do you say that? Because you don't. You don't like any schools. You don't like a million things. You don't. I do. That's where you're wrong. That's exactly where you're wrong. Why the hell do you have to say that? I said, boy, she was depressing me. Because you don't, she said. Name one thing you like. One thing, I said, okay. Trouble was, I couldn't concentrate too hot. Sometimes it's hard to concentrate. Now, you and I have come to know Holden really well, and we know that when he says things like this, he's just avoiding the truth. And maybe his sister has kind of cornered him here, right? She, she's kind of let him know that, you know, a, a truth about himself, that he is very negative in some ways. Um, and Holden, once again, is this kind of classic case of an unreliable narrator, all right? Um, and then for some reason, you know, nothing is by mistake here. Holden might have stream of consciousness narration. He might be unreliable. He might lie a lot. Um, but nothing here is is not done on purpose by Salinger, the author. Um, once again, I uh, hope you've come to appreciate what a great writer he is, right? But look what he says. All right, I said, but the trouble was I couldn't concentrate. About all I could think about were those two nuns that went around collecting dough in those beat-up straw, straw baskets. Remember always that he likes the nuns because they represent adults that um, want to or long or vow or promise to hold on to a, a sort of innocence, right, in some ways, despite the fact that they've uh, come of age and become adults. And then I thought of this boy I knew at Elkton Hills. There was this one boy at Elkton Hills named James Castle that wouldn't take back something that he said about this very conceited boy, Phil Stabile. James Castle called him a very conceited guy. And one of Stabile's lousy friends went and squealed on him to Stabile. So Stabile, with about six other dirty bastards, went down to James Castle's room and went in and locked the goddamn door and tried to make him take back what he said. But he wouldn't do it. So they started in on him. I won't even tell you what they did to him. It's too repulsive. But he still wouldn't take it back, old James Castle. And you should have seen him. He was a skinny little weak-looking guy with wrists about as big as pencils. Finally, what he did, instead of taking back what he said, he jumped out the window. I was in the shower and all, and even I could hear him land outside. But I just thought something fell out the window, a radio or a desk or something, not a boy or anything. Then I heard everybody running through the corridor and down the stairs. So I put on my bathrobe and I ran downstairs too. And there was old James Castle laying right on the stone steps and all. He was dead and his teeth and blood were all over the place and nobody would even go near him. He had on this turtleneck sweater I'd lent him. All they did with the guys that were in the room with him was expel them. They didn't even go to jail. That was about all I could think of, though. Those two nuns I saw at breakfast and this boy, James Castle, I knew at Elkton Hills. The funny part is, I could hardly even knew James Castle, if you want to know the truth. He was one of these very quiet guys. He was in my math class, but he was way over on the other side of the room, and he hardly ever got up to recite or go to the blackboard or anything. 
Now, he doesn't tell Phoebe about his experience with James Castle. Maybe, in, F, in essence, remember his protector complex to maybe preserve her from this very kind of negative moment that he's experienced. Um, but there's a lot here. There's so much here. And I think, you know, when we talk about all the things that, that are wrong with Holden, obviously a lot of it stems from Ali, uh, the experiencing of the death of a younger sibling. And we talked a lot about how might might have represented um, Salinger's own war experience, right? That Ali maybe wasn't necessarily a younger sibling of the author Salinger, but that maybe Ali was a conglomeration, a, a putting together of all these different friends that he had made that had died, right, in Europe during World War II. And that profoundly affected Salinger and in the narrative, obviously, um, Holden. Um, but, you know, um, when we look back at life, as many of you get older, you'll see that there's a lot of experiences, some positive and unfortunately some negative that are going to come to define who you are as a person and your character. And this is very much one that had a, you could tell, had a huge impact on Holden for a lot of reasons. First things first. All right, let's take a step back. Let's look at some literary devices. All right, um, because you can't really analyze literature like we've been discussing all year without looking at the techniques, the methods, the elements that writers use. Right. Um, one of you or some of you actually picked up on this in your writing. I was very, very impressed. So, you know, Salinger created this novel in a very kind of intricate way, like we discussed on the surface, rambling, um, upset teenage boy, but below the surface a wonderful narrative of uh, a testament to symbolism and coming of age and uh, a damning testimony against uh, society and everything that's wrong in many ways uh, with the American life of the 1950s and even today in some ways. But um, I think his experience with James Castle, you know, is interesting. Let's look at the elements once again, right? I'm, I'm sorry, I kind of got lost there, but coming back. We, talk, we talked a lot about motifs, right? We introduced the idea of motifs, which some of you might have um, discussed or explored in other English classes, but mm, some of you, for some of you, the idea of a motif is something relatively new. Uh, so let's just go over it. A motif is a type of technique, right? It's this kind of reoccurring event or image or idea that helps more than anything really to develop a sort of theme, right? Um, and look what's happening here, right? Um, symbols are, are different from motifs in the sense that symbols are tangible objects. Yeah, symbols oftentimes also help to develop themes, like almost every device. Remember always that theme is this culmination. Everything kind of works towards teaching us something, right? So you can make an argument that everything really teaches theme. Um, symbols help to develop themes through tangible objects that hold different, greater, intangible meaning. Motifs are different though. They could be events, actions, they don't necessarily need to be tangible, right? And look at the motifs that we've seen so far. We have the motif of games or sports, which you and I have discussed, which help to develop this idea within the novel of conformity, of following the rules, um, of going through the motions of life, the way uh, society has planned for us, right? Um, school, getting married, having a job, paying your taxes, conforming in terms of fashion, lifestyle, right? playing this game of life, as Spencer calls it. And the motif of sports is spread all throughout the novel. Um, I think at one point I had a student once count, there's some mention, I think of something like 17 or 18 different sports or games of some sort within Catcher in the Rye. The second motif we discussed is a motif that kind of comes to an end towards the end of the novel. Uh, in the last chapter we discussed during the lecture, right? The, last, the second motif was the motif of things that are frozen, right? Things that can't progress. Right. The novel takes place or the flashback takes place in the majority of it during winter. So the motif of frozen works well. You see mention of snow, freezing, cold, ice, uh, icicles quite often. Right. Um, and it kind of, the motif of things being frozen kind of comes to represent Holden in many ways. Right. This is a buildings roman as a genre. It's a, a buildings roman is a type of novel in which a young protagonist has difficulties moving forward or growing up or coming of age. And the theme of, or the motif, better said, of Frozen really helps to kind of represent that, that Holden is stuck, right? Uh, think about like what we discussed regarding the Peter Pan complex in some ways, right? This idea that Holden wants to be like that museum, frozen in time. He's obsessed with mummification. That's what he writes his essay for Spencer about. Uh, this is a boy who desperately wants to preserve and um, really just limit the amount of change and vicissitudes in his life. Let's see if you guys remember that word, right? Vicissitudes was one of the pr previous SAT words. Um, so the motif of, that second motif helps to develop the notion of Holden being kind of stuck. 
The third motif that appears in the novel is a very interesting one, and it's the motif of falling, right? If I'll have you think back all the way to some of the earlier chapters, there's a moment, I think, in chapter two or three where Holden talks about how he's crossing the street and he feels like he's falling into the curb, right? Um, so the motif appears very early on, but it, it definitely makes its grand entrance, not only with the mention of James Castle's death, but also with the revealing of what the meaning of the title, the catcher in the rye means, right? Um, so the motif of falling appears all throughout. Um, Holden mentions that he feels like he's falling. That might come to uh, mean early on in the novel that he feels insignificant, that he feels like he's becoming less, that he's stumbling at life, right? Uh, and then look at James Castle's death, literally a fall also in some ways, right? This kind of suicide by jumping out the window. Um, so the theme, the motif, better said, I'm sorry, of falling appears quite significantly throughout the last chapters. And we'll, you'll see that we'll bring it up again as we kind of conclude all the things. But keep in mind that here's where it make, makes its grand entrance in some ways, okay? Um, let's talk a little bit about what happened with James Castle. There's a very obvious association of Holden with James Castle, right? Their names would be called together. Um, in a twist of irony, James Castle is kind of wearing Holden's turtleneck when he commits suicide. I mean... Forget about just seeing someone die and in such a tragic kind of impacting hor horrific way. But then to see that person dead with an article of your clothing, I think that hits home um, uh, a lot, actually. And, and you can tell that Holden has a lot of, or reserves a lot of trauma for what he's seen. Look what happens to James Castle. You know, a lot has been said about the names. You know, the more you analyze the names very, very carefully, the more you start to realize in this novel that uh, the names were all chosen by Salinger very, very kind of carefully. Um, and look at James Castle there, right? Uh, castles uh, are oftentimes regarded for their stature, for their... Um, you know, a lot of literary critics have come to, you know, the idea of, of castles as being very high and James Castle as committing suicide by jumping in some ways. Um and look what happens to James Castle. He's, he says something to a boy, uh, which isn't really much of an insult. He just kind of calls him conceited and arrogant. And the boys come into James Castle's room. And, you know, one of the things that I find very disturbing about this scene is that Holden, as a narrator, is a boy who's willing to curse. He's willing to talk about things in a disrespectful way. But look what he says there. He says he's unwilling to retell what these boys do to James Castle. Right now, you and I know very well that and we've read Lord of the Flies that sometimes kids even not just adults, but kids can be incredibly cruel to one another. So, I mean, think about what these boys must have done to James Castle in order for James Castle to choose suicide as an option. Right. And I mean, a lot of literary critics have said that anything could have happened, anything from sexual abuse to uh physical torment to i mean you know unfortunately one of the sad truths about humanity is that we are kind of capable of great harm towards one another and yet look again this is just another example of holden looking around at the world and seeing that things that are innocent and nice and respectful like james castle look at james castle i mean he has an honest opinion about this boy who quite honestly doesn't appear to be or doesn't seem to be a nice kid uh, Phil Stabile, and he's unwilling to take it back. If anything, James Castle represents idealism, you know, these strong convictions that we have sometimes and how sometimes the, the world and all its negativity forces us to reduce our ideals or that sometimes people die because of holding fast to their ideals. Look what Holden's learned through James Castle's suicide, that the world is disgusting, that there are people that unfortunately sometimes can be incredibly cruel and harmful, that humanity is capable of great evil, right? This isn't just a boy who's jealous of Holden because of his suitcases or doesn't talk to him because he finds out that Holden is in the same religion. Now, this is something really horrific that Holden sees, right? And all the, all the events or all the details surrounding James Castle's death um, make it even more horrific. Not just what happened to poor James, not just the act of suicide itself, not just the proximity, the closeness of Holden in terms of the sweater he was wearing and the name, right? Um, I think one of the reasons why this makes an appearance this late in the novel is probably because Holden's starting to become suicidal himself. And you'll see that he'll mention this off uh, towards the end of the novel. 
Um, but also, like, look what happens to James Castle, a boy of ideals that the world destroys, right? And then look what happens to the boys. Nothing. Nothing at all, basically. You know, I think one of the things that that that's hard to digest as we become older, and I've seen this a lot in your writing, a lot of you have written great reflections on the beauty of childhood and why it's awesome to want to stay a child, um, and why the adult world can sometimes be a little bit, you know, not appealing. Um, but look at look at what happens to the boys with James Castle. Nothing. One of the things we learn of as kids is that, you know, the bad guys always lose. Scar is always defeated, right? Uh, the evil witch uh, always gets cast away, right, in some ways. But as we become older, I think one of the things that's hard to come to terms with in terms of coming of age is understanding that sometimes bad guys don't pay the price. You know, that um, sometimes good guys lose. That there is a lot of uh, inequity and things that are not fair in the world. That's a hard thing for kids sometimes to come to terms with, right? Because as we're, we're raised, a lot of our parents and society and school teaches us that, uh, you know, uh, being good always comes with rewards. Being bad always gets punished. Um, and unfortunately, you know, something, something that can be very jarring and definitely represent, I mean, think back to many of you, your childhood. I'm sure there was a moment there where you started, you woke up and you realized, wait a second, bad guys sometimes win and good guys sometimes lose. And that can be a little bit like turn your world upside down, right? Think about the way like fairy tales and Disney movies are presented, like we discussed in class, this romanticized view, happily ever after, evil never wins. And for Holden, I think this represents a moment in life where he comes to terms with the fact that there is evil out there. And not only is it not punished, um, but it also sometimes has the ability to destroy things that are pure and innocent with no repercussions whatsoever. And I think the death of James Castle contributes just as much to Holden's kind of negative mindset as, as much as Ali's death did, right? If anything, it probably augmented it and kind of made it even worse, Holden's view of humanity, right? That sometimes death happens because of something that is out of our control, like leukemia, a genetics, let's say, mishap or misfortune and then sometimes uh horrible things happen at the hands of people that are just evil in some ways okay so the death of james castle is important not only for the impact it has on holden but also because it introduces this last motif of falling which is essential right to understanding a lot of things specifically the meaning of the title which we're going to go over now okay so Right after uh, Holden has this thought of James Castle, which he doesn't share with Phoebe, um, let's pick it up from there. Phoebe tells him, remember, she's asked him, you don't like anything. And he, she says, you can't even think of one thing. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. We'll do it then. I like Ali, I said. And I like doing what I'm doing right now, sitting here with you and talking and thinking about stuff. And Ali's dead. You always say that. If somebody's dead and everything and in heaven, then it isn't really... I know he's dead. Don't you think I know that? I can still like him, though, can I? Just because somebody's dead, you don't stop liking them, for God's sake. Especially if they were about a thousand times nicer than the people you know that are alive and all. Old Phoebe didn't say anything. When she can't think of anything to say, she doesn't say a goddamn word. That isn't anything, really. Stop swearing. All right, name something else name something you'd like to be like a scientist or a lawyer or anything and look at phoebe here in this scene right look how much more mature she is she understands she has she has the closure with her brother's death that holden never had because phoebe although young is mature enough to understand that you have to close the door on events in your life and you have to move forward right and she challenges holden to like something that that is here that is present not something that was in the past, right? And then look what Holden says. This is the moment where Holden reveals his final escape fantasy, which be it becomes known as the catcher fantasy. All right. So before we share the catcher fantasy, let's go back to a certain couple of things. Um, these are some of the questions that we discussed, all right, throughout the course of the last lecture. So I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, and let's talk a little bit about here, the catcher and the ride. So let's read the scene first. 
And then we're going to discuss and pick it apart in terms of symbolism and what the messianic complex is. And I don't want to overload you with too much information this lecture. So we're going to, I'm going to bring it up now, but we'll kind of review it uh, in the future lectures. Okay. So I don't want you guys to feel like you're absorbing a little bit too much. You know that song, if a body catch a body coming through the rye, I'd like, it's if a body meet a body coming through the rye, old Phoebe said. It's a poem by Robert Burns. I know it's a poem by Robert Burns. She was right though. It is if a body meet a body coming through the rye. I didn't know it then though. So it's interesting here, right? Holden comes up with this whole fantasy about wanting to be the catcher in the rye. And it all comes from the fact that he's misconstrued or misheard those lyrics. Now, let's go back to a previous moment in the novel, right? Holden sees that little boy and he's singing this song, If a Body Catch a Body Coming Through the Rye. And he's kind of balancing. Do you remember that scene on the curb? And we talked about how on one side he has his parents and it represents all the protection of parents and childhood. And on the other side that he's balancing on the curb is the dangers of the cars, everything that's represented by the adult world. Right. Think about how often as a kid you're told from your parents, be careful crossing the street. A big moment uh, of coming of age is when you're able to cross the street on your own. Um, and look how Holden comes up with this. Right. So uh, I thought it was if a body catch a body, I said. Anyway, I kept picturing all these little kids playing some game in this big field of rye and all thousands of little kids and nobody's around. Nobody big, I mean, except me. And I'm standing on the edge of some crazy cliff. What I have to do, I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean, if they're running and they don't look where they're going, I have to come out from somewhere and catch them. That's all I do all day. I just be the catcher in the rye and all. I know it's crazy, but that's the only thing I'd really like to be. I know it's crazy. Old Phoebe didn't say anything for a long time. I wonder what Phoebe's thinking here at this moment, right? Is she thinking, wow, my brother's nuts? Or maybe she sees in her brother something that we're about to discuss now, okay? So first things first, in order to really understand all the things uh, that involve in this kind of complex catcher fantasy, right, and how they're kind of connected to a lot of things, let's go, let's talk a little bit about where the title comes from. So Robert Burns was a Scottish poet who wrote this poem called Coming Through the Rye, which later on became a very famous song. Now, remember always that poetry and song kind of go hand in hand. And in the older days, poems and songs were kind of interchangeable, right? Nowadays, music is kind of much more standalone song lyrics. But back then, it was very common to turn poems into songs. And this is the song that that little boy is singing that Holden encounters midway through the novel, and which he kind of constructs this kind of fantasy in his mind about who he wants to be, all right? So Robert Burns was a Scottish poet. Uh, if you take a good look at the screen here, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, that's written in the much more kind of Scottish, older English way. And if you look at the right-hand side, it's a little bit more of a standard English tradition uh, translation that you and I would have a lot more uh, ease understanding. Um, so interesting fun fact, by the way, Robert Burns is a Scottish poet who has uh, the, he's famous because two of his poems have be, have lines in the poems that have become two very famous titles of two very famous American novels. So you have a Scottish poet from the 1700s who in his poetry, right, uh, wrote some lines that later on American authors adopted as very famous titles of their novels. And again, and you'll see me bring this up throughout the lecture as well, the notion there that um, all, all literature is really based on illusion and what came before it, right? Robert Burns also wrote a poem called To a Field Mouse. And in that poem are some very famous lines. It says, the best laid plans of mice and men sometimes go awry, which means sometimes go wrong. So Robert Burns's poem is actually where the title of the novel of mice and men which many of you might have read last year or in eighth grade came from it was a novel by john steinbeck and his other poem here coming through the rye is where the catcher in the rye gets its title so let's read the standard english translation i'm not going to read it in the scottish Oria. um <laughs> just kidding but um let's read it first right so coming through the rye by robert burns coming through the rye oh jenny is all wet poor body 
Jenny is seldom dry. She dragged her, her he, she dragged her little petticoat coming through the rye. Coming through the rye, poor body, coming through the rye. She draggled all her petticoats coming through the rye. Should a body meet a body coming through the rye? Should a body kiss a body, need a body cry? Shh, coming through the glen, should a body kiss a body, need the world know? Should a body meet a body coming through the grain? Should a body kiss a body, the thing is a body's own. Now, many of you are probably like, oh, here we go, another poem. What the hell does this mean? And it, this one can be a little bit confusing, so let me give you a little bit of context, okay? Believe it or not, this poem is about a sexual encounter, okay? It became a very famous song afterwards um, that I think a lot of people lost the meaning of the original poem. But, you know, when we think about, like, sex and sexuality in, in modern society and modern life, a lot of us think, you know, we oh, well, the world was a lot more Christian back then. And people, that doesn't mean that people didn't have um, affairs or didn't conduct themselves in ways that maybe society didn't consider to be the most ideal behavior. All right. Um, and if you lived in a town and you wanted to meet your boyfriend or your girlfriend, or you wanted to have a, an encounter that maybe you weren't able to have in public, hint, hint, uh, a lot of people would go off into the fields and into the rye fields or the grain fields, right? A lot of towns in the old days were near agricultural farms and things like that obviously to sustain the food necessary for the town. So people would go into the rye. Rye is a very high wheat, very high grain, right? And because of that, you would be able to kind of hide in it. Think of like high cornfields and stuff. And look what's happened here. Jenny's entering the rye field, right? And she's wearing a petticoat, which was this kind of like very laced up kind of jacket that women wore in the old days. And look what's happening. She's coming into the rye field, clean, wearing her clothes, and she's coming out of the other side of the rye, dragging her coat, dirty, right? Um, and if you look at the little picture there on the song lyrics, you can see that she's walking through the rye with a gentleman. And in many ways, what this poem represents is the loss of innocence, right? Which is such an important part of the catcher in the rye. The poem represents a loss of innocence because Jenny is entering the rye field, probably virginal, pure, clean lacking sexual knowledge. And look, she's coming out of the other side, right? Dragging her coat, much more experienced, right? Um, and obviously having come of age. Uh, now, rye, you know, one of the things we discussed a lot this year are these kind of timeless immortal symbols, right? And some of the most immortal, what, you know, we talked a lot about the symbol, timeless universal symbols of water, light, fire, right? One of the more uh, timeless symbols also in human literature is wheat, grain. It's very important. It's one of the staples of, we discussed, of, um, of nutrition, right, for a lot of human civilizations. Think about how every culture in the world has something that has to be on the table for it to be a meal that's somehow made with grain. In the Western world, it's mostly bread, but it comes in other variations. It could be tortillas. It could be arepas, right? It, uh, in other countries, it comes in the form of pita bread. It comes in the form of rice. It comes in the form of um, non bread, for example, in South Asia, right? So it comes in many ways, but so rye and wheat and breads and grains and things that we make, which are a staple of our diet, are very symbolic. And they're usually symbolic of life, all right? So make sure you know that. The same way light represents knowledge, right? The same way water represents life or purity is the same way oftentimes rye and wheat and grain are symbolic of life, right? Uh, because they have the ability to sustain life through food, through nurturing, but they also represent experience, right? Remember that symbols are tangible objects which represent things that are intangible. Rye is a wheat, it's tangible. Life experience is something intangible, right? So now that we know that rye represents life and wheat and grain, that's gonna allow, and now that we know where the, the poem uh, this literary illusion that Holden creates this fantasy comes from. Now we're going to better understand the catcher fantasy and the meaning of the title. Okay. Um, now just to go, just to kind of add on to it, just to show you that weed and life, weed and grain represent life, right? Uh, oftentimes um, when we talked about anthropomorphism and personification in class, right? We talked about how death is oftentimes antho anthropomorphized in the form of the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper always carries around this scythe as a weapon. It's not because it's this huge knife that looks kind of scary. It's because a scythe is used to cut rye, 
and cut the tops of wheat, right? And that is what symbolically death is here to do, to kind of symbolically cut your rye or cut the wheat, right? in essence, right? Or cutting life, cutting experience, just to go show you how everything's very much related in some ways, right? Okay, so now that we know that rye represents life, let's talk a little bit about um, Holden's catcher fantasy. Let's just review, right? So the event situation that Burns describes in his famous poem seems to be some sort of a sexual encounter, a loss of innocence, which happens to be uh, what the poem explores as a theme, right? We discussed a lot of how many of us lose our innocence. And one of the more defining moments is obviously sexuality, okay? Um, look at the third question there. What significance, significance exists in Holden's misinterpretation of the diction in the poem from me to catch? You know, maybe it's Holden's protector complex, right? The idea that the the catching seems to be a, an important, I don't want to call it a motif in the novel, but it does make a lot of appearances, right? Maybe it goes along with falling, the idea of when somebody falls, you kind of catch them. Um, if you'll remember, one of the more important symbols early on in the novel is the, the, the symbol of Ali's glove. What's a glove used for, a baseball glove, to catch, right? And it's interesting, Holden mishears the words, and it might be his protector complex, right? That is kind of, remember, that complexes affect the way we view everything, right? And maybe it even affects the way Holden kind of hears the lyrics to this poem or this song, right? Um and the protector come. The notion of catching is like the notion of safeguarding something. When an outfielder catches a ball in base in a baseball game, he's securing it, right? When you catch something, it's almost like you're shielding it. You're protecting it from from this fall of sorts, right? So there could be some significance there in Holden's misinterpreting this as simply just yet again his protector complex. This notion of wanting to preserve to to kind of protect things, to catch things, so to speak. Okay, let's move forward. So take a look at the symbolism here. Once again, Catcher in the Rye was never made into a film. You and I have discussed a lot why. So you have a lot of very kind of illustrations here. I think when many readers first read Holden's Catcher fantasy, Holden seems like he's crazy. I mean, he even acknowledges it. He tells Phoebe, he goes, I don't know if I'm crazy for thinking all this, right? Um, but take a look at the Catcher fantasy. Holden imagines that he's a the same way he is now, and that he imagines that life is like running through this field, this big field of rye, right? Imagine yourself running through like a cornfield or a rye field, right? One of the qualities would be you wouldn't really know what's coming, right? Um, if you really think about it, um, uh, many ways, that's what life is. I mean, one of the first works of literature we read this year in class was a wonderful poem called Traveling Through the Dark. Remember the man who finds the dead deer? And um, in many ways, this is life. You're kind of like going through your days and you don't know what the next day will bring. You're running through the rye field, right? Imagine yourself as a child too. You kind of, children love to run, right? And then look what Holden imagines. Holden imagines that all of a sudden this rye field becomes a cliff and that children are like, go from running happily through this field, not knowing what's coming, experience life. And then all of a sudden, whoo, this huge drop, right? And if you look at the symbolism within the catcher fantasy, it's very well constructed. If the rye represents life and experience, the fall, the drop, the cliff come to represent in many ways adulthood, right? Uh, that children go from this innocent, blissful state, right? And all of a sudden they find themselves falling towards this precipice of danger in many ways, right? Um and we discussed a lot how you and I, and, and you know, I, in, in the more ideal romanticized way, people tend to lose their innocence gradually, right? Um, for most of us, we lose our innocence, you know, through little things. Um, we find, uh, we catch our parents in a little lie. We have our heart broken. Um, we do something that we shouldn't have done. We steal or we lie to somebody ourselves, let's say. Right. Or we find out that Santa Claus doesn't exist or we start to question our own religion or, you know, and then all of a sudden we're 16, 17, 15. And uh, like I told you, a stupid English teacher like me comes along and asks you, well, are you innocent? And a lot of us are like, well, I'm no longer innocent. But it happens so gradually for many of us that we don't notice that it's slowly dissipating. Slowly we're losing it. We lose our ability to use our imagination. Right. We see our parents differently. We think differently about school. We want to wear different clothes, wear different music, listen to different music. And all of a sudden we're like, we lose our innocence gradually. Yeah, there are big milestones and big experiences like sexuality, for example, like graduations, 
like falling in love, right? Um, like unfortunately traumatic experiences too, losing a loved one. But for the most part, we lose our innocence gradually with these benchmark moments, these two or three or four things that have happened that really bring a lot of experience. But look for holding it. There's nothing gradual about it, right? It's not like the grain or life slowly becomes less and less and you start to see what's ahead of you. It's this steep drop. For Holden, this is what adulthood is, right? For Holden, who's experienced the death of a brother, a suicide, right? Who's been uh, personally let down by many of the people around them. For him, it's a steep drop, right? These kids are in a state of bliss, happiness, ignorance, and then boom, right down into adulthood, a fall of sorts, right? And look at Holden. He wants to catch him. He wants to prevent them, right? A lot of, a lot of, Critics look back at this and, you know, it's very easy to fall into a trap and say, well, Holden's a moron or Holden's um, crazy or uh, he's a lunatic for wanting to do this. That this isn't uh, how could you possibly preserve the innocence of all the kids in the world? How could you become the catcher in the rye? Right. And the truth is, you know, as much as Holden, this is yet another misguided escape fantasy by Holden. Right. The truth is, in many ways, this is a very noble thing that Holden wants to do. Holden wants to imagine a world, ladies and gentlemen, where adulthood didn't, where there was nothing negative in the world, right? Imagine a world of that childhood bliss that so many of you long for in your writing, a lack of responsibility, um, an ignorance in terms of the world's evils and hardships. Now, I'm not saying that this is positive or negative or that we should all stay in the state forever, but look at Holden. You can you can see that he, he he's such a good wholesome, noble character at heart. This is the boy who doesn't sleep with Sonny, right? This is the boy who does a lot of very noble things, right? Who thinks nobly, yes, he's critical. Yes, he's judgmental. Yes, he's unreliable and all these other things. But deep down inside, what he wants more than anything else, right, is this part of his life when he didn't feel the pain that he does. And he wants to limit that pain in others. So while it's easy to say that Holden's crazy for his catcher fantasy, I think it's a very noble thing, right? To kind of want to preserve uh, innocence, right? Now, what's interesting about this catcher fantasy is that it brings up a lot of things. Number one, Holden's not a child in this fantasy. Holden is an adult. Holden, in order to prevent the children from reaching the cliff and falling, has to have fallen or been on the edge of the cliff himself. And because of this, this protect it, this isn't necessarily a protector complex anymore. This is something much deeper now, right? A protector complex is the desire to protect things that you see as innocent or pure or weak or vulnerable, right? Which you and I obviously discussed comes from Ali. And now we know probably from James Castle as well, right? Um, but uh, this now presents something called a messianic complex. Messianic complex comes from the word messiah, which means a savior. Right. In a lot of old religious ideals, a messiah is a person who gives their life, right, uh, like a martyr of sorts to, in order to help other people. To save others, you must sacrifice yourself. And look at the catcher fantasy. That's Holden is an adult in the catcher. He's willing to give up his innocence, his adulthood. Uh, I'm sorry, his childhood, right, his purity in order to preserve others. And I think that's what makes it noble. And I think that's why Holden sees himself as this savior of sorts or desires to be the savior, right? He wants to shield you and I and everyone else from war, from death, from disappointment, from disillusionment, right? From being judged by others, right? And he so desperately wants to preserve this. And again, the motif of falling shows up here, right? The motif of falling that we just discussed a little bit that shows up earlier in the novel, shows up with James Castle's suicide, shows up here in the catcher fantasy, right? So ultimately, what is the catcher in the rye? What is the meaning of the title? It's it's a desire, a desire to preserve innocence, purity, beauty, right, in our lives. That's really what the catcher in the rye is, and that's what it means to be the catcher in the rye. Right. I'm not asking. I mean, it's very obvious that this is not possible. Right. One of the things that's, you know, and I, again, I don't want to jump ahead and start talking about the conclusion of the novel and all the lessons it has. But let me just pose this question to you now. Right. Can you truly, truly appreciate childhood? Unless you become an adult. Right. I mean, 
what do we know? Like we discussed, I mean, that's one of the psychologically, one of the, I think, interesting things philosophically also about life, right? That you don't know life without death. You don't know health without sickness, without darkness. There is no light, right? Um, without maybe this experience of COVID-19 and being forced to stay home, maybe a lot of you are starting to gain an appreciation for little things like school and taking the bus, or uh, some of you wrote us about the cafeteria lunch that you miss. You know, so sometimes the not having is what makes us appreciate the having, right? So I'm not here to tell you whether or not Holden is crazy or whether or not this is a fantasy that is absurd. All I can tell you is that in my personal opinion is that this is a noble fantasy, right? Because Holden wants to help others and help children. Um, and whether he's absurd or crazy about it, um, in his own cockamamie crazy way, um, Holden does want to be not in a religious sense, the Messiah, right? But just like this person who's willing to sacrifice himself for the good of others. And that, that is worthy. And that for me is why I forgive Holden Caulfield as a character for a lot of the things that he does wrong, because deep down inside, he has this wonderful desire to want to help. Okay. So let's move forward. Now, a fallacy is something that is wrong, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about what fallacies or what things that are wrong exist in Holden's fantasy. Is it possible to preserve innocence forever? Again, like we just discussed, um, you know, life is full of things that are disheartening or disillusioning or or that um, in many ways perturb or bother us, right? I mean, you can't go through life in innocent bliss. I mean, there's a fine line between being innocent and being naive or ignorant, Right. And unfortunately, life comes with tragedy. Tra tragedy is tragedy, I'm sorry, is unavoidable, right? What makes innocence and childhood so beautiful is because for many of us, it is devoid of tragedy. You know, we aren't aware that life comes to an end or that friends can betray or that unfortunately hearts can be broken and that bad guys win. You know, for Holden, that drop, that steep drop that is adulthood is steep because he is one of the unlucky ones. And unfortunately, there may be some of you right? Um, that have had a bad experience where, where childhood isn't something that is preserved throughout your life and you lose your innocence slowly, but instead it is a steep drop, right? And I think one of the things that makes childhood beautiful is that it is temporary, right? Again, I don't want to give away too much of the ending of the novel, right? Um, but if you really think about it, right, what makes childhood precious is that it is temporary, right? That it is a small stage of your life, Right? That as adults, we look back and long and yearn for a lot of you. And, but one of the things I want to stress to you guys is that everything really is kind of relative, right? Because what right now, a lot of you are teenagers and you look back and you long for a moment when you were six or seven or eight or nine or 10 and things seemed a lot e uh, easier and more innocent and, and um, I don't know, with a lack of responsibility. But the truth is everything's really relative. When you're 20, you're going to wish you were 15 again. Right? When you're 30, you're going to wish you were 20. When you're 50, you're going to wish you were 30 again. Right, And that kind of makes everything very relative. And I think it's important to kind of look at things in that way. And that's why it's so important to live in the moment, soak it all in. Right, Because the truth is, you know, the things that we take for granted now, we are going to wish we had in the future. Okay, um, And for those of you who are Star Wars fans, I don't expect everybody to get this illusion. Right? But take a good look here. Don't grow up. It's a trap. It's from uh, Return of the Jedi. Um, and that's my cheesy attempt at a joke. Let's move on. Now, just to show you how all things are really related, right? And how you can't really teach an English class without discussing in some ways religion, because a lot of early literature is all really religious literature. It's all based, right, on these kind of uh, the relationship of man and God. And that's the only thing that early men saw worthy enough to write down. And a lot of the things, whether they're religious or secular, which means non-religious, if you go back to the root, a lot of them stem really from the Bible, from the Torah, from uh, the Quran, from these older uh, Greek mythologies, right? Because this is the, these are the first narratives that kind of set a foundation in many ways, right? You and I discussed the narrative of Genesis. We read it when um, we discussed Lord of the Flies, which is also a novel which was about a bunch of boys losing their innocence. It seems to be the common theme here of Catcher in the Rye. Uh, and Lord of the Flies, even though the setting is so different, right? You can see how two different situations can still teach the same thing, this kind of losing of innocence. And there were a lot of allusions to Genesis, the Garden of Eden in Lord of the Flies. 
And one of the things is that the narrative of Genesis, where Adam and Eve eat the apple and lose God's favor, how we become less, oftentimes is referred to as the fall of man, believe it or not. The narrative of Genesis is also called the fall in classical literature because we go from a state of being high and closer to God, more innocent, more pure, and then by eating of the apple and, and disobeying God, we've kind of fallen off, so to speak, right? So the falling in the catcher fantasy is not only a development of the motif of falling, it's also an allusion in many ways to the biggest fall and loss of innocence in human history, according to religious scripture, which is this fall of man from God's grace to, to this kind of mortal creature or being that we are, that we went from a state of bliss, right? This state of kind of innocence and purity, right? Being close to God, speaking to God, being in his constant presence, Right? And then falling into something a lot less innocent or a lot less um, pure, so to speak. In many ways, you know, I, again, I don't want to go against people's religious beliefs, but if you look at religious narratives, not so much literally, but as poems or as literature that's meant to be interpreted, right? You can argue that very much the narrative of Genesis and Adam and Eve is very much nothing more than a narrative of, of coming of age, right? Um, Adam and Eve as these childlike, innocent, blissful but also kind of ignorant creatures right that lived in this paradise like setting where the world was great there was no responsibilities no pain nothing nothing negative and then the eating of the apple of knowledge right in many ways right the knowledge of good but also now the knowledge of evil this losing of innocence right uh, it has a lot of very deep very spiritual very kind of deeper meanings these older narratives right um, that's why uh, religious scripture and an English literature class go hand in hand, because a lot of, you know, say which, whether you're religious or not, one of the things that you can look back to these older narratives, the themes there are some of the most important themes in all of human history. And the narrative of Genesis is a beautiful narrative in terms of, I mean, really look at it, right? It's, it's, it's look at the apple and all we discussed. You can get lost in the sexual symbolism of the apple and the snake. And that maybe Adam and Eve is really a narrative of sexuality, right? Eve becomes knowledgeable of her sex first. She eats the apple first because women oftentimes go through their those menstrual changes first. And look how she shares her newfound knowledge with Adam, right? Not that, not that Eve is guilty, right? As sometimes some um, scholars or religious scholars see this as the woman as being weaker, as having tempted Adam, but simply as being more knowledgeable, more mature, as being able to uh, understand the knowledge and then share it with Adam, right? Um, so it's an interesting take on the Genesis narrative. It's also the idea of falling, all right? And I'm pretty sure that Salinger included all these religious illusions to give his narrative more depth. Remember always that religious illusions, things like Christ figures and um, all these mentions of Greek mythology are really to give a, a work of literature, a much more solid foundation. And he does this really, really well with The Catcher in the Rye. All right, so let's just kind of review what we discussed today. Uh, it's a long lecture, so I'm going to give you two days to do it and answer the questions. Um, so look what we discussed. We discussed James Castle's death. We discussed a new motif, which is the motif of falling, right? Uh, we discussed also what the catcher fantasy represents. We discussed the symbolism within the catcher fantasy, the symbols of rye, uh, the idea of catching, right? Falling as a motif. Um, we discussed the meaning of the title, obviously, which is the catcher in the rye fantasy. Um, we also discussed the religious illusions of this notion of being the catcher in the rye. It's, it's connection to Genesis, religious scripture, and things along those lines, all right? And now I'm going to share with you one final secret, okay? Let's look at Holden Caulfield's name. All right. Some of you might have figured this out. And again, the more you look at the names in the catcher in the rye, um, and again, Salinger didn't answer any questions. So this could all just be a bunch of crazy English teachers and literary critics trying to find too much knowledge, right? In just um, what an author writes. But the more you start to realize, the more you realize that Salinger did a lot of things on purpose. We discussed um, what Phoebe's name means. We discussed Carl Luce's name. We discussed Sally Hayes's name. Faith Cavendish. We discussed her name. We discussed Sonny's name. 
right? We discussed maybe perhaps the symbolism of Ali's name, right? We discussed why Ward Stradlater has this kind of very elitist, um, very kind of um, Anglo-Saxon name. We also discussed uh, why Ackley had the name he had, all right? Um, so names definitely were something that uh, Salinger as an author was very much um, focused on. And look at the name Holden Caulfield, ready? This is just too much uh, coincidence to not have been done on purpose. Look at the first name, Holden. Hold, to hold something, to preserve it, to protect it, to catch it, hold. Look at the second part of Holden's name, Den. I don't know if a lot of you know this, but a den is a place where mammals usually go to raise their children, right? Raccoons will build a den, for example, right? In order to raise, protect their children before they go off into the wild by themselves. So you have hold and then you have den in Holden's first name. And then take a look at the last name, Caulfield, right? The last part, field, should become very clear to you what that means after understanding the meaning of the title. The rye field, right? This kind of representation of life, of this running uh, in blissful harmony, right, through this long or this very tall rye field, not knowing what's going to come next. So the field there, in Caulfield's name, representing the connection to the rye field, right, coming through the rye, Robert Burns, the poem, the meaning of the title. But then take a look at that first part of Holden's second or last name, a call, a call, C-A-U-L, if you look it up now, is a thin membrane right underneath the amniotic sac that protects the embryo, the unborn fetus, right, in a, in, a, in a woman's womb. So a call is like this thin protective sac, right, that protects a fetus. And what's more innocent and more beautiful, really, than a baby, right? Um, and the call there is there to provide nourishment, right, but also to protect and secure the fetus in the womb. So there you go. The more you start to see and look at characters' names, the more you start to realize that Salinger constructed this novel in a very kind of intricate, kind of jigsaw way, right, where everything is connected. Now, again, I say this over and over, and you guys are probably like, here's Pujol talking again about literature. But if you were ever to go back, just like when you watch a movie that has a surprise ending, and then if you go back and watch the movie, again, you start to see the things, the little clues, the foreshadowing that you didn't see before. If you read reread Catcher in the Rye, I promise you, right, it will be f as fulfilling as the first time because you're going to start to, once you understand the final message of Catcher in the Rye, you're going to start to see, right, um, the pattern in the matrix, haha, so to speak, all right? All right, guys, that's end for this lecture. This lecture is going to be a two-day assignment. I know it's a little bit long and it contains a lot of information. Um, so I just want to give you guys ample time to do it before we move on to Mr. Antolini uh, and this sort of mock mock trial, so to speak, uh, which I'll give you further instructions for later on this week. Uh, love you guys. I mean it. Um, I miss seeing you guys every day, greeting you at the door, saying jokes, um, making you say good afternoon or good morning to me. Um, I just miss being around you guys and asking you questions and making you laugh and having you make me laugh. And um, really, if this experience, if we get anything positive out of it, hopefully some of you have gotten, and I'm getting the sense that some of you have, but I hope some of you have gotten the notion out of this that, you know, that school is worthwhile. And even though sometimes we hate waking up in the morning and getting on the bus, that it's something that it maybe some of you have taken for granted. And then maybe when we do get back, whether it's September or a couple of months after that, um, that we kind of don't take for granted. Uh, and I never really took for granted being a teacher. It's something that I always loved, but this experience has definitely taught me that it's the most amazing part of teaching. Isn't the literature is it, isn't the symbolism or the motifs. It's really just being around you guys, right? I really mean that. Um, and I can't wait to see you guys again. Um, all right, I'm going to put up the lecture questions and hopefully um, you understand the things that were discussed today. All right, be well.